Now, what is an environmental portrait? Well, um, quite simply, it's when you photograph someone, uh, a person, in their workplace, usually undertaking their profession or doing what they do. And these uh, type of workplace portraits or working portraits, environmental portraits, whatever you want to call them, um, they're in quite high demand uh, in the professional photography market from clients. And the reason is that many businesses, rather than just have a standard portrait of them on a plain background uh, as their profile picture, many businesses want to show what they do. They want to be represented in such a way that the portrait demonstrates a little bit about the company, a little bit about the services they offer. And these sort of portraits are also very common in annual reports uh, those type of documents and in the hospitality industry in particular I've shot many environmental portraits over the years where you're photographing you know things like the chef preparing food or you know the uh, chamber maid making the beds and those type of sort of reportage style shots people kind of a little bit in action doing what they do or at least standing and placed in the environment. Now, um, the difficulty with them is that quite often you don't know what you're going to be dealing with. You don't necessarily know the person you're going to be photographing, uh, the outfits they're going to be wearing, the location, the lighting and everything else. And you have to deal and manage with those difficulties as the photographer. And what I've done in this series of environmental portrait tutorials is teach you how to manage those difficulties and show you a number of scenarios where we're confronted with those problems and difficulties and how we overcome them. I've also made a little bullet point of extra things to consider um, that I wanted to bring up in this introduction. Uh, and then you'll obviously see the photo shoots take place and how we overcome the problems but I wanted to make this introduction section to go over some of these things and talk about some of the shots that we did and just give you a little bit of extra information so so let's kick off on that um, you, you'll be able to see on our website that we've got a series of these environmental portraits covering some different working professions. Um, we were actually in Switzerland uh, doing some work for Broncolor and while we were there we took a few days to task ourselves to do some environmental portraits particularly for this. Uh, the great thing about them is that we didn't have the opportunity to recce, that's reconnaissance, any of them. So we turned up blind pretty much at every location and had to deal with what we were dealt. And that was a great way to teach you guys how to overcome some of the problems. I would always recommend doing a recce of the location if you're able to. But um, these examples are great because they showed us situations where we weren't able to do the uh, reconnaissance. Now we tackled uh, a, an electronics worker in a factory, a farrier, that's a blacksmith working, a cake designer, uh, a carpenter in a woodwork plant, and a uh, whiskey uh, sommelier in uh, a whiskey basement shop as well. And each of these presented their own problems in terms of lighting, mixed lighting or no lighting or small spaces and I was really pleased with how we overcame the problems and all of the problems had to be overcome with studio lighting but mobile portable studio lighting so we used the Cirrus battery pack lights for these and fairly standard modifiers and as is usual for environmental portraits, it's about mixing the daylight element with the studio lighting or whatever ambient light and mixing it with the studio lighting. Or in a couple of cases, there was absolutely no daylight to work with. So it was creating a mood that felt like daylight totally with studio lighting. So what I wanna do now is take a look at a couple of examples of the images to show you what we had to start with and where it ended up and then also go through some of these uh, additional points. So um, let's start off with the cake decorator. 
I've got a number of uh, what we call build-up shots here. These are the sort of test shots that we've taken as we work towards the final result. And these give a good indication of what we've got to deal with. The first image there that you can see is actually a screenshot from the video guys making the tutorial. And you can see me crouched down right in the corner of this basement room. And you can see our subject sat at the table there. Now, just to give you an idea, this room was completely pitch black. It was an underground basement level room and it had just fluorescent lighting in it. And it was quite a compact room as well. So the first thing I did was figured out, you know, what my background was going to be and which area I was going to shoot with. And you'll see that in the video. Uh, but you can see the, the uh, space difficulties that we were faced with. And here how I've used this table area uh, that we had available in uh, the foreground there. And I started to place a few bits to lead the eye into the shot. But this shot is mostly just to show you that we literally were working in a basement with no natural light. Yet we were able to achieve this final result. And what I managed to do with the shot was create a bright, airy light feeling that looks like natural light coming through some large windows, little sparkle of daylight, feels very light and dainty, and it's totally on um, point with the atmosphere that you want to depict for this type of person and this type of career. You don't want to show a beautiful uh, cake designer, cake decorator in some dingy basement studio. So we had to set the impression to look completely something uh, different. And I think you can see there from the previous shot uh, compared to what we ended up with. But how do we get from A to B and all of the steps in between. Well, there are some things that we need to consider, which I'm going to come to. But before we do that, let's just look at um, a couple of other things here as well. So if we go to the um, whiskey uh, sommelier, and we'll go to, here's the, uh, we'll go to the behind the scenes image. And this is again, this was another one that was in a basement. So there was no natural light. There was lots of little floodlights and spotlights in the room. You can see Tim there with the camera and while I'm just sort of figuring things out. And it was a very, very busy environment. Lots and lots of stuff crammed in there and very sort of difficult to, to know where to work with. But there you can see what we had to start with in the basement. And here you can see the final result where we've selected the right depth of field, the right mood, managed to get some lighting and glow and color coming in through the bottles in the background. And that wasn't an easy task, but it's about controlling that environment and basically creating the right mood. And the mood that we needed for the whiskey sommelier was completely different mood to the mood needed for the cake decorator and designer. Let's take a look at another example. And this one was uh, the woodworker. And the woodworker, this is the space that we had to work in. Here you can see some of the studio lights in position and Ashley already uh, down there taking uh, some test shot on her phone, I don't know why, but uh, there's the very busy, scrappy room that we had to work with. You can see there's a lot of natural light coming in from a couple of directions, but that natural light alone wasn't enough. As a matter of fact, if we look at the first test shot, that is the first test shot with just the natural light and no flash. So you can see how dark the room would be when we have to get the exposure correct for the windows uh, and, and everything else. So all of the rest of the light that we are going to throw in there is artificial light, but it needs to look like natural light. And here's the final resulting shot that I was very pleased with. And this has the feeling of natural light still coming through the windows at the correct exposure, but still natural light look to the portrait and to the room and to the machinery. And it's all about carefully positioning things, repositioning things, testing your lighting, and gradually working your way to the final result, which you will see in the videos. 
but let's look at some other key things that maybe are not covered in detail in the videos because they obviously focus on the uh, techniques and the step-by-step -step process. But I wanted to talk about a couple of things that you should plan to do in advance. Now, the first thing is research the location. Now, one thing we did do with each of these was take a look at the website for each company to see what existing pictures they had and take a look if they had any existing environmental portraits. Some of them did, some of them didn't. The cake designer did, and we were able to ascertain at least what the room might look like that we were going to work with, just to get an idea. So if you don't have the opportunity to do a full-on recce in advance, do some research, look up their website, and, and try and figure a few things out there. The second key point is, know what it is they actually do. There's no point going to take an environmental portrait if you're not sure what it is that that company does because you can't really represent them in a portrait if you don't know what you're representing. So do your research again, find out what the company does, find out what the activity it is that they uh, undertake, what they specialize in and what the person you're photographing generally does for a living. The next important thing is don't assume that they have the right clothes. Many people go to work in all sorts of odd garments and dress differently in different days. Some may have uniforms, some may not. And those clothes may not be appropriate for the photograph. So let the company know, give them a heads up about that, and maybe to just discuss that with them in advance about having some um, options on the clothes. Um, now, as I said, normally do a recce if you can. In the examples, we weren't able to do a recce, so it is, um, it's a good opportunity to see how we deal with that. The other thing to keep in mind is the short availability of your subject. Many of these people don't have time for standing around for an hour and a half while you do test shots and set up your equipment. Um, so it's much, much better if you've got an assistant, take an assistant with you. That helps with loading and carrying the gear from the car or however, uh, your transport, etc. cetera. Um, so first of all, an assistant is fantastic for setting up, testing lights, but most importantly, for standing in as the test subject. You can get everything set up, everything positioned, use your assistant as the stand-in and then when you're ready bring the subject in for five ten minutes get the shots done you don't disturb their working day too much and then you're done and finished without the stress and hassle of having to try and create a set around your subject while they're standing there breathing down your neck the next tip and bit of advice is get there early okay never arrive late don't even arrive on time, get there early, because if you get there early, you keep the client happy and you can spend an extra 15 minutes looking around and starting to get a feel for what you've got. Now, the whole thing about getting there early as well, which we did on all of these shoots and you'll see, is I spend that time looking around, walking around the location, seeing what areas I've got to work with, what opportunities are available, and then making the decision. And then in that process, don't let the client guide you too much. You know, if you spot an area that you think works really, really well and the client's okay with it, but they kind of suggested another one, go with what you know is gonna make a good picture and explain that to your client. Um, because there's no point just going with what the client says if you think it's going to make a bad background or a bad photograph. Um, the next key thing, and this is really, really important, and you'll see us do this plenty in these videos, is don't be afraid to rearrange the set, rearrange the location. When you find the right location, you're gonna find things in the wrong place. This is gonna be in your way, that's gonna be in your way, or this would be better if you move it forwards a bit, or if you take that out the background. So just do it. Don't worry about it, just do it. But one thing you must do is take some photographs on your iPhone or your camera in advance, take some reference images so that you can put everything back where it belongs when you've finished the shoot. The next thing, and, and probably the most important, is think about the mood that you want to invoke with the lighting. What is, this, what is the mood of the lighting going to describe? You have to think about the profession, you have to think about the workplace, you have to think about what they do, and you have to think about the emotion that you want to convey, and that's going to dictate the lighting style that you go with. And obviously, if you're not completely familiar with that, we've got plenty of uh, chapters here on Carl Taylor Education that talk about 
lighting emotion and, and those uh, topics. Now, the next thing is consider the existing lighting that's already there and what you're going to use of that and whether you're going to mix any of that into your artificial studio lighting. So for example, in these cases, where, where possible, I brought daylight into the shot and mixed it with my flash. In other cases in the basement, there was no way I wanted to bring fluorescent lighting from the ceiling into my shot. So I switched all that off and went totally with artificial studio lighting, but made it look like natural daylight. Um, the, the other thing you want to consider is communicating with your subject. Make your subject, your portrait subject, feel at ease. Have a good conversation with them. You can do that far easier when you know you've got everything set up and everything's working and your test shots look great because then you've got the confidence that everything's right. One of the things that I do with my subjects to help put them at ease is just talk about what we're doing and say, you know, we've got this light set up here and it's going to be doing this, it's going to be lighting here, this one's going to be lighting the background and it's going to highlight this, this and the other. Now they might not really care but it's something that you can talk about confidently that then inspires confidence in them that you know what you're doing and that is a, a really good icebreaker for the conversation to flow and to put your subject at ease because it's much better if your subject feels they're in safe hands because then they'll feel more at ease about having their picture taken. Uh, the other thing is um, check your final images. And this is really, really important, is when you're taking those shots, before you let your subject leave, you may have thought, yeah, that looks really good on the back of the camera. Very happy with that. I know my test shots were good. I know my lighting was good. But have you actually zoomed in on the subject and checked that the focus hasn't shifted? Have you checked that their pin sharp? Is the depth of field sufficient? Are there any minor details that just looking at on a small screen on the back of your camera aren't going to reveal? So go in and check those details with the zoom button on the back of the LCD and pan around and have a good look at the picture before you let the subject leave because there's nothing worse than getting back after you've packed everything up, traveled an hour or whatever it is you've done and then finding out, oh, hold on a minute, my focus point were set manually here and then they moved four or five inches forwards and they're a little bit soft in the shot. So check these things, final details, because if you make a little error like that, it's no problem to just keep your subject there for another five minutes and then correct it. But it's a disaster if you have to uh, go back to the client and say, oh, I'm sorry, all of that work was for nothing. So that's my final and main piece of advice on top of those top tips. So those top tips will help uh, get you going with environmental environmental portraits and those series of videos are going to really help you understand the process and the uh, way to approach environmental portraits uh, for your business. Get my completely free photography course with no sign up required. You can also access our free 90 page ebook. Just click the link or go to carltaylereducation.com.